Hi, everyone, and welcome to the live nonprofit sales webinar, Catch That Grant Funder's Attention in a Crowded Space, sponsored by Guide One. My name is Niti, Editor-in-Chief of Nonprofit Pro, and I'll be your host for today's event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Jackie Ross has been fundraising for Newark area nonprofit organizations for 20 years. For the first 12 of those years, she was a development director of four community-based organizations affiliated with the Episcopal Diocese of Newark. These nonprofits focus on affordable and supportive housing, foreclosure and home buyer counseling, community development, and a variety of supportive services for the very poor. Jackie joined Crystal Ray Newark High School in 2011, where she is now VP of Advancement. The Crystal Ray Network is the largest network of high schools serving low-income youth in the U.S. using an innovative corporate work-study model. Additionally, she has raised over $40 million during her career from government, corporate, foundation, and individual services. And Lawrence Pagnoni is chairman of LAPA Fundraising, serving nonprofits throughout the U.S. and Europe. He is the author of The Nonprofit Fundraising Solution, the first book on fundraising ever published by the American Management Association, as well as his latest book, Fundraising 401, Master Classes in Nonprofit Fundraising that would make Peter Strucker proud. Now, before I pass the baton over to Jackie to kick off today's webinar, I want to take a few minutes to set the stage for today's presentation. For many nonprofits, many nonprofits rely on grants as a main source of their funding, especially in today's climate. In fact, LAPA Fundraising just reported that it raised $1.4 million in 10 weeks for COVID-19 emergency relief funds, 80% through grants and 20% through individual gifts. I'll be sure to share additional details on Nonprofit Pro's Twitter account, so be sure to check that out. But as many of you listening today know, securing funding for your nonprofit profit through grants is no easy walk in the park. It takes time, preparation, research, execution, and follow-up. With over 1.5 million nonprofits that exist in the U.S. alone, it's fair to say that the grant landscape can be pretty, pretty competitive, which is precisely why every nonprofit that depends on funding through grants needs a strong grant strategy. In a recent Nonprofit Pro white paper, we shared four steps to nailing your next grant proposal. These tactics included communicating with grant makers beforehand, clearly articulating what your nonprofit's need is, writing smart objectives, and defining what your success would look like. But creating and submitting an awesome proposal is only part of the equation. That's why we've invited, invited both Jackie and Lawrence onto today's webinar so that they can share additional insights on staying ahead of the curve during the grant process and standing out with key communication and relationship building strategies. So here's what you're gonna take away from today's presentation. Where to look for grants and how to find the right funder for your nonprofit, what funders are looking for in the application process and how to communicate with them, why relationship building engagement matters with funders just as much as it does with donors. Today's talk will be very interactive as Jackie and Lawrence have a pre-existing relationship and have been working with each other as consultant and client for about four years now. Throughout the course of the next hour or so, they will share insights as well as experience and lessons learned along the way. So before we get started, let me take one second to point out the tips for attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the tech tip video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information. Also, we will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so you can enter your questions for that at any time using the Q&A box in your console. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jackie. Thank you, Nu. It's a pleasure to be here to help all the very hardworking people I know that are on the webinar. So um, today we have about a dozen tips to secure private foundation uh, money. So we're going to uh, talk first about the current context. Uh, we'll start with a few comments because we uh, cannot ignore what's going on right now. Um, and I will say that most foundations have altered their priorities to coronavirus relief. 
In many cases, even if we have already submitted an application, we will contact our current funders to ask them if they will fund COVID relief instead, and they're usually very amenable to that. Uh, it's very important to keep close contact uh, with especially your major funders to update them about your needs and uh, to ask for additional support if you need it. Make sure you know your numbers. Uh, for instance, an approximate financial negative impact that COVID might have on your organization. I think this is especially important even if you're not on the front line. Thanks, Lawrence? Jackie. This, thanks, Jackie. This is Lawrence. Um, also part of the current context is the stock market's volatility. Uh, all foundation endowments have been negatively impacted. Um, however, foundation giving in 2020 is often set aside from the endowment and placed in a reserve fund that's not exposed to market volatility. That's usually the case, but not always. The big picture is that foundation giving in 2020 is expected to be down by 4.8% overall. However, another nonprofit, the Wounded Warrior Project, during the 2008 recession, uh, when foundation giving fell by 7%, they were able to lay the groundwork for their own future growth to move from being a $21 million organization in 2008 to a 400,000, 400 million, I'm sorry, $400 million organization seven years later by 2015. The short answer is that market volatility should be watched, but it should not deter you from pursuing grant funding. Jackie? So what if you're not on the front line? Very important. Stick to your message and stick to your mission. Definitely resi resist the urge to ask for money simply because there is a financial crisis going on. Remember, your donors are not giving to your organization. They're giving to a cause they care about. Don't let the pandemic change your message. Do, however, highlight the most relevant part of your message. Even if your organization isn't directly responding to the current and health economic crisis, your mission might still be impacted. In fact, I'm pretty sure your mission is being impacted by now in some way. And it's important to remember that this is not over. Lawrence? So uh, we have a dozen tips to share with you, and they're broken up into about four different major categories. Here's our first category having to do with qualifying funders. And these tips apply now during COVID-19, but they also apply in non-pandemic times. The first tip is to cast a large net. Look at your funding opportunities from many different angles and search out funders whose priorities might be closely aligned for each one. For example, an organization that serves a military-related cause might interest funders who award grants for veterans' issues, as well as those whose priorities include public affairs, war memorials, and national defense. All these areas need to be researched and checked well. Jackie? So, same with qualifying funders. Tip number two is meticulously sort and filter. Don't waste your time. You know how important your time is as a fundraiser. Believe the foundation's websites and their marketing materials. So, for example, don't pursue foundations who exist to fund a designated nonprofit and exist only to raise money for that particular agency. Don't waste your time writing an application to a foundation that whose uh, geographical priority does not encompass your service area. They mean it. And lastly, don't write an application to those foundations who support only their own in-house programs. Lawrence? 
changing major subjects to talk about having the conversation with the foundation. Our third tip is to identify the best person to talk to. If the party on the other end of the line says, you should speak to this person, I'll transfer you, get that person's direct number or extension before you're transferred. We recommend three attempts within seven working days to reach the foundation officer through a combination of phone and email, and we frequently mail a copy of the email with our business card as a last resort. In the time of COVID-19, email obviously is proving to be more effective than calling offices. Jackie? That's very true. So tip number four, clarify current funding priorities. Make sure the funding priorities that are listed on the website or the foundation are still current. If you can get a conversation, you could say, I reviewed your guidelines and website, but I have a question about your current grant priorities. Also, use that opportunity to make your pitch. Make, make, a, make a short and clear pitch and finish by asking if the mission of the program would fit the funder's current interests. We emphasize current because just because the website says what they generally fund, that does not tell you if they have a particular focus this next funding round or even this particular year, especially now when the world seems to be changing day by day. And also take note, negative information, for instance, finding out what their limitations are, that kind of information is just as valuable as the positive information. Lawrence? Continuing with having the conversation with the funder, tip number five is ask your program officer when and how to submit. Be sure to ask, are there any upcoming deadlines I should be aware of? If not, is there one time of the year that's better to submit than other times? Are there times when funds are usually more available? Or when does your board meet next? A board meeting date is a clue to when the proposal should be submitted. Don't forget to ask, do you prefer hard copies? If they do, ask how many copies of the proposal and the attachments would you like? Can we send the proposal to your attention? When can we expect to hear back? And never forget to check the mailing address to make sure that it's the most current one. So now we go to knowing how much to ask for, the big question. Tip number six, check the funder's website or their IRS Form 990 to assess giving ranges. First, go to the funder's website to find a list of their past grantees and investigate the award amounts. And in addition, you can check their IRS Form 990 for past grant information. Um, today, it's best to go to candid.org, C-A-N-D-I-D, Org. That's the old GuideStar, because GuideStar and the Foundation Center have merged. So that's the new one, Candid.org. Seeing their range of grant amounts will inform how much you should request. Sometimes uh, they might have one huge award amidst the sea of the small ones. Why? Well, if you can get that conversation, ask the Foundation officer what conditions they look for when they make a truly extraordinary gift. Lawrence? That last tip, Jackie, was worth attending the webinar uh, just for that, <laughs> for that one. I know, um, I know. On the subject of knowing how much to ask for, tip seven is ask a program officer. Do ask the program officer if the amount of your request is appropriate for them, especially if your nonprofit is new to them. Alternatively, you can ask about their, their range of funding. Some program officers respond very helpfully to such questions. Jackie? Make sure your attachments are up to date. I'm glad we still have this tip in here. This is something that so easily can, 
uh, be forgotten. And then when you need it, it's not updated. It's a, it's a real pain when you're under deadline. I try to check all of my attachments at, at the start of each of my fiscal years. Um, be sure the financial statements you're submitting are the most recently available ones. Very important, make sure your board list is current. This might be the first attachment that they check out, and members can come and go every year. Um, same thing for principal staff members. Make sure those are updated, and I feel it's also a good idea to have current bios just for the principal, the key staff members. That's often asked for. And of course, finances are huge. Are your organizational and program budgets current? And do they square? Do they make sense, especially with the audit and the Form 990? And lastly, are your press clippings out, out of date? I have noticed in my career the last, I would say, three years, marketing has become more and more important. The funders today, uh, your website is the first place they're going to go. So you want to make sure that all the information on your website is accurate. Lauren? Tip nine, strict compliance yeah. with funder requirements. If the funder wants a signed statement that the board has authorized the submission, has stipulated that the page limit is five, or that all components of the application should be submitted via email, via PDF, have you noted and complied with these requirements? We estimate that 15% of all grant submissions are rejected for noncompliance. That's a lot. So tip number 10, save copies of all submissions in one well-organized place. Everything today needs to be electronic. So make sure you have that electronic file so that you can get anything you want at your fingertips at, in a second's notice. Remember, those deadline days can get really tough and you want this to be as easy as possible for yourself. Lawrence? Tip 11, save the award letter. The award letter, not the proposal or the application, is the legal document specifying how the funds are to be used. Consequently, the award letters are what your organization's auditor needs to examine. Scan a digital copy so you have a backup as well. The award letter is the final determinant of how you can use the grant, not the proposal. Many grants ask for program support, but the award letter is more flexible, allowing you to use it for general support. Becky? So tip number 12, send funders a cultivation letter at least every six months. I think that you can use your grant cycle as a great time to cultivate your relationship. Don't let it go until the next time a grant is due. I might add here, that your thank you letter could be your first cultivation letter. You can put in achievements in your thank you letter that you've had since you put the grant proposal through. You can put in attention-grabbing anecdotes. Uh, you can put in right now how you're uh, handling the COVID crisis, uh, all kinds of things like that. And, into the, and in addition to that thank you letter, about halfway through the grant year, you should send a thoughtful letter aimed at reviving your program officer's interest and goodwill. What should it contain? Uh, highlights of the past six months. A good idea is if you've gotten any significant funders in that time, they will like to hear that you're doing so well that you're attracting other funders as well. Uh, this is going to be a good year to use cultivation letters because you're going to have something to say when this COVID uh, crisis is over and, and you've gotten through it. Don't forget to add your funders to all your social media and your email newsletter blasts. Send those to them. Social media is getting bigger and bigger, and especially corporate foundations. They love to see their corporations out there as much as possible, and I'm sure private foundations are the same way. Lawrence? Um, one of the uh, viewers asked us to repeat the URL for 
it's Candid, and again, so I'll repeat it now. It's uh, www.candid, C-A-N-D-I-D, dot org. That's C-A-N-D-I-D, dot org. Um, I imagine that some of our answers may have generated more nuanced questions as it relates to your agency. So on this last slide is our contact information. Um, Lawrence Pagnoni, Lawrence at LAPA Fundraising, L-A-P-A Fundraising.com, and Jackie Ross at J Ross at C-T-K Prep.org. Earlier in the call, New mentioned that we had just succeeded at raising $1.4 million for COVID relief funding um, in the last 10 weeks. We have an impact report. If you email me, I'd be glad to send you that. The reason I mention it is that um, reporting to your funders about your impact of your COVID response is important, and our report may serve as a model for you uh, on how to do that. Uh, New, uh, I turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Lawrence. All right, everyone, we are going to open up Q&A. So if you have a question um, that you would like an answer from Lawrence or Jackie, please submit it in the Q&A box below. Um, I do all see, right. Uh, we have a few questions a in question. here right now. Oh, go ahead. Um, so <laughs> there's a question up top here, and, you know, Lawrence, you can answer this. And, Jackie, if you have experience on this, then maybe you can speak on this as well. But it's how do you address an organizational deficit in proposals? Okay. So first, let's clarify. Uh, sometimes nonprofits tell me they have a deficit, and what it really is is a projected shortfall. So it's June the 3rd today. Maybe you've just uh, revised your budget, and you see that you still need, you know, 120000 for the year. That's not technically yet a deficit. That's a projected shortfall. The difference is that a deficit – is what you want, you've overspent and the books have closed. Now, so if you have a deficit and the books have closed, um, hopefully you have some reserve funds that offset that deficit. Um, a best practice in the nonprofit world uh, as set by the National Council of Nonprofits and also the Better Business Bureau is that you're allowed up to three times cash reserves, three times your annual budget. Now, that for many of us is an extraordinary uh, benchmark. Um, most of the clients we work with strive for a six-month reserve. But the, the, the best practice is, is uh, three years. And so hopefully your deficit is offset by that. Uh, if it's not offset by any reserves or endowment, then um, very difficult. It, uh, if it's a small deficit, it's, it's probably insignificant. But if it's at least uh, maybe 15% of your overall budget, then that becomes something that you're going to have to address. So uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that some clients we've advised to address it in an annual letter when they send their audit out for the executive director to write a thoughtful letter about why the deficit is and what you're doing to create it. Um, one, of, uh, one of my former clients that was a, that is a $45 million organization, they had a $16 million deficit. So you could make uh, darn well sure we uh, spent a lot of time, it was a five page letter covering the, uh, the audit to explain the deficit and how we were addressing it. And um, we got a lot of feedback from funders that the letter uh, in encouraged them to stay uh, giving to the organization. And then we followed it up with uh, phone calls to every funder. So um, deficits can be scary, but you have to first make sure it is a deficit. And then secondly, if it's significant, address it proactively with a letter 
from your uh, from your executive director. Yeah, uh, the only thing I'll add from the client side of that is that I've worked in nonprofits in Newark for 21 years, and you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I have worked uh, in organizations that are almost always running at a slight deficit. I've never worked in an organization, I don't know if it's the marginalized populations that I choose to serve or what, but I will say this, I try not to bring attention to a small deficit. I, foundations really know what they're doing. They know what to look for. They're gonna look at your audit. You always want your organizational budget to balance. When you're giving your operational budget to somebody, make sure that those expenses and those incomes match. They're going to look at the audit and they'll see um, deficits. And, you know, a lot of nonprofits run at, at a deficit or a small deficit. So they're, in my experience anyway, um, if it's not too egregious, just don't bring attention to it. The funder is going to know when something is really, really long, wrong. Trust me on that. And um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, you just don't bring attention to it. Uh, not that you're lying about it or anything like that, but they they expect some amount of struggle in the nonprofit industry. Awesome. All right, so we have a couple questions on this next one here, which is uh, how, how do we navigate funders who don't accept unsolicited requests? Are they simply off the table, or is there a way to build a relationship? Lawrence, I don't know well, if you want to uh, chime in on that. Yeah, the, uh, the, the I get this question a lot. Um, there's a, I've, written, I've written a blog post about how to handle, we call those do not apply DNA uh, foundations. Um, they tell you, you know, right in the app, you're reading it, you're all excited. My goodness, this is a great fit for us. And then you get to the, the death knell <laughs> line at, at the end, do not apply without prior invitation. <laughs> oh, good Lord, you know, talk about ruining one's day. But the thing to do is um, you have to use relationship science, um, either the old fashioned way by looking at their board members and see if anybody in your network knows one of them and can have a personal conversation to see if you can get invited to submit. Uh, here at LAP of Fundraising, we do that using relationship science software where we're able to determine who knows whom and, uh, and then follow that network. So uh, we're successful in uh, getting around Do Not Apply Foundations by about 35% of the time. Um, and um, a second tip I'd give you on how to get around DNAs is that you can look at who who they do fund. Uh, and I used this method uh, just last week. Uh, I came across a funder that did, you know applications were not welcomed, but I noticed that they funded an agency, a nonprofit, and I have a long collegial relationship with that agency's executive director. I called her up and I said, would you put a word in for me? Uh, and, um, and then uh, about two days later, I got a phone call from the foundation officer. So re it's all about relationships. And um, uh, so they're my two tips on that. Is that helpful? Yeah, I just, yeah, I'd just like to add, yeah. I'll add just one thing. Um, I also look at the board members of the foundations themselves and see if there's any kind of connection that we can make between any of our stakeholders, our board and other people as well, who are part of our quote unquote family, and see if they know anybody on their board of trustees. And remember to look also at, at all your stakeholders. You know, you might have a lot of lawyers that are connected with um, your organization. In my, in my case, Cristo Ray Schools, we have corporate partners that provide internships for our students. It really expands the uh, people uh, who have influence in our circle. Uh, so, we, you know, don't just leave it to your board, but look at who else might be able to advocate on your, who would be willing to advocate on your behalf. 
Great. Um, so as we're on the re- on the topic of relationships, um, let's talk about cultivation letters to funders. Um, so, Lawrence, in talking about cultivation letters, do you recommend, recommend a letter versus an email, or are you recommending sending only to those funders who have granted you granted to you previously? Um, the cultivation letters go to uh, funders who have granted you previously, um, but in some cases I send them as well to prospective new funders, uh, but I make sure the introduction is tailored um, so that it's not an abrupt, um, you know, just getting a letter in the mail that seems out of context. Um, I generally, uh, in normal times, (laughs) I would email them (laughs) and mail them, but right now um, I'm just emailing. I find that that, uh, postal mail um, is not getting to people, they're not going to their offices as frequently. But um, if I don't get a response back in a couple of days, then I do mail a hard, by email, then I do mail a hard copy. And just to give you a sense of how disciplined we are around that, I actually make a calendar reminder three or four days asking myself, have I heard back from X, Y, and Z Foundation? you know, based on my email. And if I haven't heard back, I resend the email. And then if another three or four days passes and I still haven't heard back, then I mail a hard copy. So um, um, that's that's how I combined email and mail. I'll just add that, um, you know, most of you know that when you're sending in grants today, 99% of them are, are electronic. And they give you either 1,000 characters or, if you're lucky, 2,000 characters per section. So you've got to be a really good writer. You've got to be able to chisel that down. And you can't really get emotional. And you can't put, like, too much anecdotal information and stuff like that into a grant proposal anymore like you could when you could send them through the mail. So what I've done is I've actually brought my – thank you letters, my cultivation letters up to a fine art. I really use them for that opportunity to say, oh, you know, we just sent our uh, 100% of our kids to college this year. And, you know, I, I use those, uh, uh, those letters as a real opportunity to get my emotional um, point across. Absolutely. Awesome. I think that's a, I think that's a great, great tip. Um, all right, so someone's asking the name of the report that you referenced to Lawrence. I think it's called the COVID-19 Impact Report, right, Lawrence? That's right. I'm getting a, and a lot of emails. And I linked it to the Nonprofit Pro Twitter account for anyone listening who just wants a quick link to it. Just check out our Twitter account and our most recent post. You can just click it straight from there and download it. Um, all right. Uh, Lawrence. What are some ways to seek initial funding for a new nonprofit? Well, there are incubator foundations that have a bias towards new nonprofits, so it depends on what your mission is. Um, And um, there are some missions that the incubator foundations uh, are more interested in right now, given um, the state of the world. And um, so it, it depends on your missions. But um, uh, I would uh, strongly urge you to think about, to make sure you understand your field of service very well. For example, I recently got a call from a Virginia nonprofit that works in the field of veterans affairs and they wanted to start a new a new nonprofit and in northern virginia there is a an extraordinary glut of nonprofits my word uh um that that works with veterans so uh, i asked them how much did they really know about the other nonprofits did they do a competitive analysis and they had not so I walked them through how to do a competitive analysis, and they're doing that now. 
because they'd have to distinguish themselves from the other organizations so that they have a message of what's unique about them as compared with others. Um, but if you don't know your field of service, then you're going to uh, have uh, an impossible time trying to, uh, to get money. Yeah, I, I just add that um, this was an area that I always had a lot of problems with because being the development director in my case of my organizations usually, um, I, my, my time was very stretched. So when I, uh, at Crystal Ray Newark uh, about four years ago, I realized that I needed help in this area and I w kept not doing it. So um, that's when I started to, <laughs> I'm not trying to put a, uh, a push here for LAPA, but this is when I, I looked around and said, you know, how am I going to get this expertise? If I just hired another development person for my office, I wouldn't have gotten that expertise necessarily. So um, I wasn't afraid to look out around and see who could help me with this. And, and you know, there's a lot of technology out there that can help you a lot more than the, the old ways of doing things. And I strongly urge people to keep on top of that technology or try to connect with someone who can help you with the, how to do that the right way. Always ask for help. Fabulous. <laughs> Um, I'm going to quickly go back to cultivation letters real quick because we did have a question come up um, after we talked about it. Are there any sample cultivation letters available to get an idea of best practice? Lawrence, I feel like you've talked about this a lot, and you might have some stuff on LAPA's blog about it. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Shirley, for, for asking the question. Um, uh, I'd rather, if you don't mind, give you some thoughts, and Jackie could could add about what goes into a cultivation letter, and that and that way you'll have a an outline. So um, yeah, do it. The first thing, the first thing in a cultivation letter is to say thank you for their past giving, um, and not just their last gift, but to share with the funder or the donor cumulative amount of their giving. A lot of funders don't realize, especially your regular donors, the cumulative, the total amount they've given to you over the years. And it really blows them away when they see that you're attentive to such a number. And uh, so that's how I usually start my cultivation with, with that very powerful uh, opening. And then secondly, I mentioned what relationships exist between our organization and the funder. You know, uh, for example, you know, uh, Mrs. Uh, Smith on our board um, is a, a very uh, uh, good friends with, uh, you know, your, one of your staff members and, um, and she sends her regards. I, I try not to be flowery and it always has to be real, but uh, pointing out the, the, the relationship intersections between the foundation and the funder are always good. Third point to cover is um, how you use their funding so far or how you're about to use their funding. Um, now, you don't need to do a full report, but you need to just say, you know, so far your funding is going, you know, we're spending it well, it's going to what uh, you gave it to us for. And then I give a little, the fourth area is I give an update about the organization. You should be aware of these three things. I, I usually try not to give more than three. Sometimes I just stick with one important thing. Um, cultivation letters are usually no more than two pages. Uh, of course, there's plenty of uh, times when I've gone past that, but, but generally I strive for two pages. So, um, uh, and then always make sure the last thing is that you thank them at least three times in the letter. Um, expressing gratitude is, is very important. Um, Jackie, would you add anything else? Because you've written cultivation oh, well, letters too. Yeah, I, I know. I, I use them uh, a lot. And um, I will say I, I love what you say about the um, the cum cumulative money that the funder has given you because they – they go beyond being a donor at some point. 
they become an investor. You know, someone who's given you $100,000 every year, depending on, you know, how big your organization, for me that was a big grant. You know, I'll say to them, you have given us over a million dollars in the time that we have been together. That is not an investment that we take lightly. And, you know, we talk, and then I'll, then I'll segue into how we have, um, what's that word, uh, stewarded their, their money and how, how we use every penny or, you know, something, something in that vein. Um, in addition to that, I always like to make sure that they feel like this is not, and you pretty much said this, Lawrence, this is not some kind of like a letter that is just a boilerplate letter. I, try, I write every one of my letters very, I might cut and paste a piece that I've been using like recently because of a, a recent achievement or something like that, but I always make sure that I am thinking about that person that I am writing to and what would be important to them and what would make them feel good and, and, and you know, make them know that I am writing to them. Like, uh, it was great to see you at the gala. Thank you so much for coming, that kind of thing. I, I also will say, um, and, and this is related to what you said too, Lawrence, the impact. Because of the donation that you gave to us last year to expand our social and emotional learning curriculum, I want you to know that 100% of our students are going to college this year. You know, something like that. I think that's a, such a great point, Jackie. Um, just standardized general emails or letters aren't going to help build any kind of relationship with supporters and donors. I think you really got to take the time to personalize it, share some impact me metrics, and I mean, just look at the data that you have on them to see what would, you know, show them that they are appreciated and that you care about them. Yeah, and I, this isn't about private foundations, but like if we ha if we do have a direct appeal where we have to send out a whole bunch of letters, we either might have a student write a handwritten thank you, which is really impactful, or um, the president of my school, who everyone loves, uh, even though he's got this like nice thank you that he uh, he composes, uh, that is the same for everybody. He will hand write mm -hmm. a note on it so you know there's different ways to to make it unique yeah. and warm but you got to remember you're you're reaching some individual who cares mm -hmm. agreed all right so this is a very interesting question um Lawrence, i'm interested to hear your take on this how many times should you reapply to a foundation after your application is denied but i also add on to that <laughs> what that so after a nonprofit is denied a grant, what steps should they take? What, what is the next step? What can they do? Uh, that is a very good question. So um, <laughs> in, the nonprofit, in the nonprofit fundraising solution, my book from three years ago, I told a story of a foundation in Florida that I applied to over seven years. <laughs> um, and I got funded in the seventh year. But here's the, here's the key. Um, I was able to talk to the foundation officer after each rejection, and she kept encouraging me to reapply um, because the project that I was asking funding for and their foundation were completely in line. And she said, it's only a matter of time. And she was right, but it took me seven attempts uh, sometimes it, that's what it requires. But um, if your application has been denied, you have to try at least three times. You'll hear my rule of three come up a lot. You have to try to get feedback about the denial. Um, and you have to, uh, you know, ask the program officer to get on the phone with you. And you have to have some preset questions. I always ask the foundation officer to be brutally honest with me. Um, what were the deficits in my application? Um, and, and then I 
you know, learn from that. And I, of course, take that knowledge and make my current grants uh, even better. But the fact is that most denials are result um, of the foundation running out of money to to give. The foundations are are often overrun with applications. You know, they might fund 40 or 50 funders a year and receive five, 600 proposals um, in, in broad in broad stroke. So. Um, if your application is denied, I always send an, an immediate email saying, you know, thank you for considering. I'd like to learn more. May we set a time for a phone call? Um, and um, this, the questions that I have prepared, um, uh, you know, are things like the the amount we asked for was that a concern? Was that uh, a factor in denying us? Was it too much or too low? Um, were you put off by anything about our program concept? Um, did you resonate with our e evaluation and impact section? Um, I, I drill down on the usual reasons why uh, a grant is rejected. Um, so that's how I ha handle it. I consider learning about a rejection fertilizer for deepening the grants program, and uh, so it's, it's really uh, good stuff to take a denial seriously and to learn from it. New, what was the second part of that question? Um, my question was, once a nonprofit is denied, what should they do next? Ah, so, yeah, yeah, find out more about why the denial happened by mm -hmm. asking for, for a meeting. Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is just make sure on the website too, they often will say you can only apply once a year um, but uh, or something like that. So you, you might find some information on their website as to, ha as to how frequently you can um, ask for money again. But I agree. I've been in the same situation where I have <laughs> I had this one uh, friend of mine who I will do some pro bono work for and like I, I wrote that grant for her a uh, grant application for her like three or four years for nothing. And then uh, the last year I was just too busy, I couldn't do it. So she had somebody in-house do it for her, and then she got the grant that year. <laughs> so that was kind of humbling. But um, so that does happen. <laughs> that does happen. You have to be uh, tenacious. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we have two follow-up questions on, you know, grant denials. First, is how soon is too soon to reapply and if the application is denied like who should ask for the funder's feedback should it be the director or the grant writer somebody else uh, i'm sorry so i didn't understand I, the I, question uh, the question um, is so there's a two-part question is. jackie so the first right. part is, is how just... soon is too soon to reapply and the second, the second part is who should ask for the funder's feedback when um, an application is denied? So uh, regarding, too, regarding too soon, um, you, that's a question that you, you ask when you, you know, email them for the conversation, you know, uh, that's part of your, your list of questions. Uh, when would it make sense to reapply? Um, and as Jackie pointed out, sometimes you're prohibited to applying for another year um, and, uh, you know, see if their website covers that. But, but do ask when you, when you have the conversation with them. Um, and the second part of the question, um, ah, I've lost the thread now. What was it? Um, the funders? Who, yeah, who should ask? Funder for feedback. Should it be like uh, a yeah. director of the organization? Yep. Oh, the feedback. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to wave my flag out to all my grant writing colleagues and uh, <laughs> encourage you to. I'm going to encourage you to not lose control of your your process. So many executive directors want to then make that call and then they translate back to you. And um, that's interesting to me. Sometimes it's warranted, but um, there's no reason the grant writer 
necessarily uh, has to involve the executive director um, unless the executive director insists upon it. But sometimes the foundation officer will tell the grant writer something that they won't tell the executive director. And um, so I encourage grant writers to not lose control of their product. Um, a compromise, of course, is, uh, is that you and the executive director could do it together. Yes, that's true. Bingo. Agreed. Nothing to add. <laughs> Um, all right, so one more question regarding a rejected application. Um, would you guys recommend sending a cultivation letter or update before applying again? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah probably, uh, especially if the foundation and your organization were value aligned. If in the rejection you found out that they had no interest in your mission and no intention to ever fund you again, I would not be sending them a cultivation letter, but if they are aligned, um, I think that that would be uh, be a good thing. I do want to add something here. Um, we, you know, we talked about the importance of relationships, and I think that what I, being part of the Crystal Ray Network, I have the benefit of having 36 other fabulous uh, development and advancement people that um, we have these cohort meetings and et cetera all the time. So we always, uh, you know, um, put stuff across the board to see what everybody else thinks. And I remember one of the development directors that I really respect a lot, she said, we never get a new grant unless, and I don't, I don't, this is not true for me. I have gotten new grants this way, but she said, unless we've got somebody soliciting on our behalf, we just don't, I don't even, I don't even write grants like that anymore because uh, I, I just don't get them. So, um, yeah, if you get rejected and you really want this grant and you really think you should get it, keep looking for people on, you know, like your stakeholders, anybody that you might be, that might be in your quote unquote circle family that might be able to advocate on your behalf and keep doing that. No is the beginning of the relationship, remember. <laughs> I love that. All right, so I think we have time for a few more questions, and you know, there's a lot coming in. So maybe I'll, we'll shoot these over to you, Lawrence and Jackie, in case you want to reach out and answer them um, individually. Um, so the next question, Lawrence, do you have any recommendations or resources for writing an LOI or a letter of intent to begin a relationship with grant makers? Uh there's some ex uh, great examples. If you just Google sample letter of intent, nonprofit funder, or or, or uh, the grant and grant foundation, you'll see so many samples. Um, uh, and um, I think Nonprofit Pro has a, a manual with a sample um, a letter of intent in it, but uh, they're abundant online. Um, and um, uh, so I, I and I, I have looked at all of them, and uh, the ones that are uh, available online are, are pretty impressive. Um, and uh, so I, I would do that. Just make it your own. That's all I can say. If, if even though you're, you know, I, I, yeah, research. See what. Uh, sometimes I get incredible wording from samples that I just couldn't put my finger on when I was trying to write a letter. But I do morph it into what, you know, the, the, the emotion is mine. The letter is mine. Great. Um, um, all right. So go ahead, Lawrence. New, new I would mention that um, we haven't gotten a question about uh, expanding your private grants portfolio to find new foundations. And I, I mm -hmm. just want to encourage, I want to encourage all attendees to realize that the state of modern prospect research on family foundations, on um, uh, national funders, you know, it's expanded greatly. And if you're not in touch with the, 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 the state of the art of modern prospect research, this is a great role mm -hmm. for for a consultant, and it's a great role for reaching out uh, and learning more about prospect research. But for example, 
a uh, affordable housing organization in Orlando, Florida, that um, uh, we're we're researching for. They generally were applying to about 20 uh, foundations a year, and in our research uh, with the state of the art, we found uh, 95 new prospects for them, and um, they were blown away. So. Uh, uh, finding a talented prospect researcher who's good with family foundations, with grants, and with uh, individuals of high net worth who have hidden donor advised funds uh, could be very valuable to expanding your uh, grants portfolio. Great. Um, so we have a question here, Lawrence. Um, you said something earlier about organizations getting denied and there was percentage. Could do you know if you could perhaps repeat that? I think someone missed this. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, Chad asked about, uh, I said 35%. Uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. that 35% yes. were denied. It, this was the do not apply question. And um, uh, I said that by following the relationship sciences, um, relsci.com, we're able to get around do not apply foundations about 35% of the time. Right. Which, which um, yeah. Cool. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what you guys said about clarifying funding priorities. Can you give some examples of negative information? Oh, yes. Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, negative information would be, um, um, that they only fund children ages three to five and you serve teens. So that's very important for you to know and you should then remove yourself because that negative information tells you that that's not a fit for you. Um, another one that Jackie mentioned was that, you know, yes, we fund, um, you know, the city of Cincinnati, but only the north part of Cincinnati. So um, finding out, you know, their restrictions on their funding is uh, just in, as important as finding out what they do fund. Yeah, I've had um, board members, I've had staff people, you know, executive directors, oh, this is such a great, um, you know, this is a Catholic institution in Michigan and they give tons of money and I look on the guidelines and I say, well, it's only Michigan, but oh, I think we should apply anyway. <laughs> Unless you know someone who knows that guy, no, this is a waste of time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we have time for one more question. Let me see. Let me find a good one. Um, all right. So as a follow-up on the conversation about differentiating an organization, how do organizations stand out, especially um, when there are so many who have similar missions? Uh, well, mm -hmm. you have to ask what's, what's really unique about your organization. And just because there are so many, um, like, for example, I, uh, I'm working with a legal defense fund, LDF, uh, in Brooklyn, and there are 116 similar organizations. But this particular organization has an approach that's very unique. So we have to make sure that the the unique aspects are uh, really stand out. If you don't know what's unique about your organization, then you you probably have to learn more about your competitors and how they make their case and then see how you can differentiate your uh, approach. But um, um, you could also ask your funders, your donors, what they find unique in uh, why they give to you. Uh, we do that through donor surveys. Excellent. Yeah, Jackie, I, would, you I would also say, yeah. I would also say, um, that um, you can, don't forget, like, I, I met with a Catholic school yesterday, right? Like, you know, they're having a lot of trouble keeping Catholic schools open. 
So um, I said, well, you know what? What else is unique about you? The population you serve. This particular Catholic school was not in a rich town. It was in a suburb that was kind of mixed. But 65% of their kids get free and reduced lunch. That's a unique quality. Your impact might be a unique quality. How many people you serve. So it's not just your service, your, the definition of your service, but there are other ways to show that you're unique. And they could be in numbers. They could be in population description. Well, awesome. Um, we're just about out of time for today. Lawrence and Jackie, thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast and sharing your insights on grant strategy. It's been it's been wonderful and a great experience learning from you both. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the partnership with Nonprofit Pro. <laughs> oh, thank course. you, New. Thanks. I hope it was helpful. Of course. Um, so on behalf of Nonprofit Pro and Guide One, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our archived and upcoming webinars. Remember that this presentation was recorded and will be sent out to everyone in the next few days or so. So if you would like to take just a minute to follow the brief feedback survey that will appear on your screen next, we would be very grateful. Your feedback will influence the webinars we bring to you in the future. So I hope to see you in the next Nonprofit Pro webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.